And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion, which, the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Be Please be seated. And let's pray once more before we begin. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, this gathering. It's time to come before you and praise your holy name. Uh, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to confess our sins to you and be reminded of uh, your grace to us in Christ. Uh, we pray now that you'd be gracious to us by your spirit, uh, causing your word to go forth uh, in power unto the salvation of those who do not know you, the edification of your people, and the glory of your name. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I've been mentioning this in our announcements over the past few weeks, but we've had the privilege of being back out at the Nampa Farmer's Market to evangelize each week. And this is simply our effort to be uh, good stewards of the grace of God, which has been given to us. Paul says this, this is specifically of ministers, but it applies to all Christians. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says that we've been made ministers of reconciliation. Because we've been reconciled to God in Christ, we're now uh, titled Ministers of Reconciliation, calling the world to reconcile in them reconcile themselves to God through Jesus. So we want to be those people in our community. That's why we're going out to the Nampa Farmer's Market. And since God has been kind to us in our efforts so far this year, we have had an abundance of dialogue with our neighbors in this context, in which they know we're coming to them as Christians, seeking to share the gospel with them, ask them what church they're going to, that kind of thing. And if you join us, you'll notice that it will not take too many conversations before you find yourself sharing the truth of God's word with a man or a woman who has their own separate worldview that's firmly planted in midair, has absolutely no roots whatsoever, and yet they believe it firmly. Some of them will speak of their concrete evidence for the truth of reincarnation. What is that concrete evidence, you ask? They had a dream, and it seems like it was from another life. So reincarnation. How can you argue with that? I mean, that's like, you know, you're, you're a juror on a murder trial, and you have a dream that night that one of the, the people on trial admitted to the murder. I mean, you bring that evidence the next day, the case is closed, right? Those are about on the same level. But that's, that's the foundation for their faith. And you see that in a multitude of ways in talking to these people. Others you will talk to in evangelism will tell you that we've always existed as spirits, right? Saying it in a lofty tone to add a profundity to what's being said. And that we are all really a part of one spirit. We're simply on this earth to, to learn from each other. It just sounds so good. Right? We're all part of this great spirit, so we're all just learning what this spirit even is. We speak to people who strongly repudiate the teachings of the Bible on the most fallacious charges. I right? had a guy telling me, oh, the Bible was written in the 300s. How do you believe that? That's just not true. So many very simple evidences. Right? These are first-person accounts that we have in the Bible. You've got men like Origen in the 100s quoting from it. So to say it's written in the 300s, just kind of an outlandish thing to, to rest your life on, right? To, to stake eternity on. But they're willingly believing these lies, simply making things up about the Bible in order to ease their consciences, ultimately, as they put forward statements that are grounded, again, in absolutely nothing. The religions which dominate our culture today can be summed up as vain philosophies. They are vain philosophies. They're marked by assertions of what is true without ever touching down in reality. These people operate under the assumption that there's right and wrong in the world. Oh, of course there's right and wrong. Of course there's good and evil, morality and immorality. But they, never, they don't have a framework for proving these things as legitimate. They have no reason to be able to hold somebody else to their standard that they're putting forward. And significantly, these people find one way or another of articulating within this framework they make some type of salvation. 
everybody in their, their framework for how the world works is articulating some type of salvation because we know innately that we need salvation. We know we're lacking something and that there's something that needs to be fixed in us. One way or another, there will be some type of salvation, whether it's through a false Christ, deliverance through the state, right? Deliverance from the evil of this physical world, a better reincarnation, whatever it may be. We know intuitively uh, that there's something missing in our lives. We're lacking something significant. And as Christians, we know that this lack is something that can only be satisfied through reconciliation with the God who made us, the one creator God. But for sinners who are dead in their trespasses and sins, they're in this position of knowing they need something, knowing they need a savior, wanting to solve that problem and yet hating the deliverer, needing deliverance and yet hating the deliverer. And so they come up with these vain philosophies. They strive through these vain philosophies and through Christian heresies to establish an alternative means of salvation. But I want to point out this morning what I want you to keep in mind as we work through this chunk of Mark 15 prior to looking more at the crucifixion of our Lord, is that Christianity does not follow this same pattern of ethereal salvation, ethereal assertions about the truth. This is, this is glorious and essential to understand. Essential to understand. One of the glorious things that separates the Christian faith from the Wiccans who are asserting that they can prove the resurrection through their dreams is that the Christian faith is rooted in history. It's rooted in history. It touches down in reality. Events have happened in the world. They've been perfectly recorded for us. And we have, as we've discussed many times before, these historical events, more than some heady theology, these historical events are the foundation of our faith. We build our theology off of these historical events. This is well reflected. Think about the creed that we recited together this morning. We recite a few creeds of this church on rotation, typically through the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Chalcedonian Creed. And each of these creeds have a heavy emphasis, not on uh, abstract theology, but on historical events that have taken place. Because we understand that those historical events shape our understanding of reality, what God is doing in the world, what he's done to redeem a people for himself in his son, Jesus Christ. All right, think about some of the things we say in the creed. God made all things. That's an act. He did that. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born on this earth of the Virgin Mary in space and time, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Jesus descended into Hades. Jesus rose from the grave. We confess this in our creeds. These are historical events. And again, they are the foundation of our faith. And we see this from the Apostle Paul as well. When you look at 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives a summation. If you're ever wondering what's the you know, most succinct gospel I can give, well, it's the first six verses or so of 1 Corinthians 15. Just a succinct gospel. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I have delivered unto you First of all, that which I also received. So here's the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was, buried, uh, and that, uh, he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this day, but some are fallen asleep. The comparison we see between the Christian faith and the pagan religions of our day is nothing less than a Wiccan with her memories, which prove reincarnation on the one hand, and a man who literally, God who literally became man, took on flesh, dwelt among us, died and rose from the grave on the other hand. That's the comparison, nothing less. These events in the Bible were recorded for us, again, by first-person witnesses, and they've been preserved for us down to today in what we should see as the abundant kindness of God. So although we have plenty of theology, plenty of understanding who God is, what he's done for us, that stems from these historical events, our faith is founded firmly in the events of history, in the world which God has made, and in which he has worked to redeem a people for himself. And again, I'm beginning here this morning, because belief in Christ... Belief in Christ requires a belief in these historical events. You must understand what happened. And then from there, you must understand and believe the implications of these historical events. 
The Bible gives us both of these things. The Bible gives us an accurate historical account of the events of history. And for, for us specifically this morning, an accurate uh, account of Christ's death on the cross and what happened as he was hanging on the cross. Right When our text says that the veil of the temple was rent in two, that's not some like lofty philosophical thing that has nothing to do with reality. That literally happened. There was a literal veil separating the holy place from the holy of holies, and it literally ripped in half from top to bottom. That happened when Christ died. What does that mean? That's a historical event, not some lofty out there thing that we can't define. And the fact that historical events are involved does not make belief in these truths any less profound than the ethereal concepts of the vain philosophies of our day. Right? The fact that the people we talk to in evangelism cannot root their assertions in anything does not make those statements more profound. Oh, that must be like really true if I can't, it's like so profound I can't even understand it. It doesn't even make sense. It's like illo- completely illogical. Wow. No. Right? Unless you're, unless you're out smoking a bunch of pot, those kind of ideas shouldn't sound profound to you. Right? That's the kind of thing you walk away with if you're, yeah, if you're high and having that conversation, then it's going to be like, whoa, I totally don't get that, but it's probably me. The Christian faith is in reality far more profound precisely because it is rooted in reality. Things have actually happened on this earth. I can't stress that enough. Things have actually happened on this earth. God has acted in such a way that the course of all of history has been changed forever through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so belief that Jesus died for you will change your entire life. But this belief must be informed by an understanding of his need to die if we were to be saved, as well as what was accomplished in his death, so that we will, and that's what we're going to seek to understand more of by God's grace this morning. Remember from last week that uh, Jesus had already been lifted up on the cross. So we're, we're coming into the middle of this narrative. Jesus has already been lifted up on the cross at the third hour of the day, about 9 a.m., and was crucified between two thieves. Christ was being mocked by the Jews who were looking on, by the chief priests and the scribes, and even by the Roman soldiers. Jesus hung before them with an inscription on a placard over his head, which read, the King of the Jews. This is the setting in which we pick up in verse 33 of Mark 15, which reads, And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. The The next time marker we receive in this account on the day of Christ's crucifixion is the sixth hour, so that's three hours later. We're at 12 p.m. the same day. So Jesus has been nailed to this cross, hanging for three hours. And at 12 p.m. we read that this would be the commencement of three hours of darkness. Three hours of darkness in the middle of the day. And what we read here should not be breezed over. The darkness which came over the whole land, this was not a normal occurrence. Something unique was happening here. And the language that Mark employs is meant to draw the minds of his readers to a clear biblical theme that they would know. But they're only going to know that, and so we're only going to know that if we know our Bibles. Part of reading the Bible, the more you read the Bible, the more things are going to open themselves up to you by the grace of God because there's so many parallels uh, throughout the Bible, so many themes that the New Testament writers are picking up on as they write uh, from the Old Testament. And so this is, again, an example of uh, the importance of knowing our Bibles. If you have not read your Old Testament, the first 39 books of the Bible, or if you have not, or if you've read it but do not know it very well, you may take this statement by Mark as just a, it's just a statement of fact. It was dark at that time, just helping to, us to paint a picture to imagine what it was like at that time, but not necessarily drawing any parallels that we're supposed to understand, any themes that he's drawing out. But the Bible, we always want to remember this and emphasize this, this helps us to understand why these parallels are so uh, important and so present. The Bible, while written by men, is under the, was all written under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit. This means that there is a cohesion to the whole thing. Right? The Bible is not a set of disjointed books. But because the Holy Spirit was the orchestrator, though working through many different uh, authors throughout the Old and New Testament, various men who wrote the scriptures, uh, he keeps it cohesive and therefore presents to us a consistent theme and a consistent aim. The scriptures are united. All of the Bible is united in their display of the glory of God, in one consistent description of how men might be saved throughout the whole thing. And Jesus tells us in the Gospels that all the scriptures of the Old Testament, which he describes as the law and the prophets, all of them pointed to him. All of them were to be fulfilled in him. 
And so what is it we should understand in regard to this statement about darkness being over the whole land for three hours in the middle of the day as Christ hung on the cross? Well, the symbolic import of darkness in the middle of the day is clearly in the Old Testament that of judgment. That of judgment. Darkness over the whole land is judgment language. This is seen throughout the Old Testament. When Amos, who was a prophet who has a a book by the same name, an Old Testament book, when Amos wrote of a future judgment coming on Israel, a judgment in which they would not hear the word of God. That's the context. So very clearly a judgment on the people of Israel where they would not hear revelation from God. He says in Amos 8 verse 9, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. This is judgment language. We saw this language already in Mark's gospel, right? In Mark 13, when we read Jesus' description of the judgment that's going to come on Jerusalem in 70 AD, remember, he talks very clearly, says the sun will not give its light. Right? This idea of, of darkness over a land, the sun not giving its light, is clear language of judgment. But the most significant example in our context comes from the book of Exodus. This is Exodus 10, verses 21 through 23. And the Lord said unto Moses... Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the whole land of Egypt. Even darkness which may be felt. This is one of the judgments that comes on the Egyptians when they're refusing to let the Israelites go to sacrifice unto God. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. So why is this not just another reference of darkness and judgment just akin to Amos? Why is this reference the most significant? Well, remember what we've seen throughout Mark's gospel account. We've seen all the way from John the Baptist's ministry. Where was John the Baptist's ministry? This man who came to minister. The people are in the promised land of Jerusalem, so he's just going to be in the midst of Jerusalem, right? No, he's actually across the river Jordan outside the promised land in the wilderness. And why was that? We looked at this when we were uh, in that part of Mark. Right? Although the people of God were in the promised land, although the temple was being rebuilt, although the sacrifices according to the Old Testament, at least according to the letter of the Old Testament, were being offered in the temple in Jerusalem, although all these things are happening, Israel was in exile, spiritually speaking. Israel's in exile in terms of their fellowship with God because being in the promised land did not automatically bless the Israelites if they had turned their hearts from God. And we've seen this is exactly what they've done as we've seen them interacting with Jesus. Right? They've turned their hearts from obeying the law of God from the heart, from worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. And so they've uh, essentially removed themselves from the promised land through their unfaithfulness. Right? And the same goes for us. This is true down to today. You being a member of a, a faithful gospel preaching church will not save you. It will not save you. If you do not have an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, you cannot be saved. If you do not have an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, you cannot be saved. It doesn't matter where you position yourself, how many faithful people you put around you, whatever the faithfulness of your context, whatever boxes you check outwardly. If you don't have an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, then he will not have fellowship with you. Israel was marked by unfaithfulness to God and therefore stood in need of a deliverance from exile even though they're physically in the promised land of Jerusalem. And so Jesus came to be that better Moses for his people. To be even himself faithful Israel. To provide Israel with a greater exile. Not a physical exile from the land, but an exile from their bondage to sin and death. A far greater, a far more important bondage to be broken from. So why the darkness? So it's there to symbolize judgment, right? We see that clearly. The darkness is there to symbolize judgment at this time, but why? Why do we see judgment being present at this time? Well, judgment was indeed descending on the land, but it was a judgment which would be poured out specifically on Christ himself. And before we consider why this needed to be the case, I think there's another parallel to the Old Testament we must understand here. There's yet another context in which we have seen this picture of of darkness descending, and that is in Genesis 15. Genesis 15, I'll just read verse 12. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. Now you'll recall in Genesis 15 
that God made a covenant with Abram in which God instructed Abram to take a series of animals to cut them in half, laying them open with a pathway in between these slain animals. God passed through the midst of these slain animals before Abram as he promised Abram to give him an heir, a son. He says, Ishmael's not going to be the promised heir. I'm going to provide you an heir through Sarah. He's going to provide him a seed more, a seed more numerous than the, the stars of the sky and a land for his people. And we see you know, what's being symbolized in this cutting of these animals and walking through it. Well, we see this exemplified in texts like Jeremiah 34. If you want to look at it later, Jeremiah 34, verses 17 through 22. Passing between these animals, God says explicitly, right, this cutting of a covenant was a way of communicating that the one who would break this covenant, right, we're going to walk through these slain animals, the one who's going to break the terms of this covenant is agreeing to be slain like those animals through which they walked. Right? Cut me open if I disobey this command. I'm willingly taking this covenant oath on myself. And so both parties are agreeing, if we break this covenant, this is what we're owed. And so what's the picture? Right? God's doing this with Abram. God is literally taking that on himself. He's saying, I will take the curse if I break this covenant. But the same goes for you. And that's what we see in Jeremiah 34. The people break the covenant. God says, you walked through this. You testified. You testified to the fact that if you broke this covenant, this, is, this would be you. And so it was. And so what is the picture being painted for us here as Christ hung on the cross and darkness covered the land for three hours? Remember that Jesus said in Mark 10, again, what we're seeing on the cross is Jesus taking what was before mainly words, him communicating through words and also through the act of miracles, what his kingdom would be about. This is him living it out, dying for his people. In Mark 10, he said that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. If there's one verse that sticks out to you in the Gospel of Mark, I hope that's what it is. That is, the, that is the theme of Mark's Gospel account. What is the nature of the kingdom of God? Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And know also that this was not happening when you think about uh, God coming down in the person of Christ. He didn't come down at a random time in a random place. God doesn't do anything in that fashion. He comes down, what does the Bible tell us? In the fullness of time. And where does he come down? To a random island of pagan people? Or to uh, Israel, his chosen people, who were meant to be a light to the nations. They were meant to be a kingdom of priests. Right? Jesus was in the holy city, Jerusalem. He came to this earth, the Bible tells us, Galatians 4.4, 4, in the fullness of time. His perfect life and his sacrificial death took place before the people of Israel. Jesus came to the chosen people of God, to the Israelites, to prophesy to them and to prophesy against them, but also to be who they were supposed to be. Israel was to be that light to the nations. We read in Isaiah 42. Israel's temple was to be a house of prayer to the nations. We saw in Jeremiah 7 verse 11. In other words, Israel is to function as the priests of the world, teaching the people the law of God. But instead, we've seen throughout Mark's gospel that they've turned inward and have been marked themselves by apostasy. They were not faithful to God. And so Christ came, Jesus came to be the true Israel, who Israel was supposed to be for the nations. Israel and all the world was in need of one who would come and fulfill the covenant in their place. For there was already a fundamental problem for us. When we think about this idea of cutting covenant with God, there's a fundamental problem in the fact that we've disobeyed that covenant. We've all broken covenant with God. Two statements from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Rome must be remembered here and kept in our mind as we move forward. Paul said in Romans chapter 3, this applies not just to those in Rome, this applies to all men who have ever lived, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul also tells the church in Rome a few chapters later in chapter 6 that the wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. We have all broken covenant with God and so we do not only need someone to uphold the law in our place, we need someone who would pay the penalty for our breaking covenant with God. This was most necessary. And if you doubt the necessity of such a death, why can't God just forgive us? Why can't he just forgive us without this whole Jesus dying thing? It seems extreme. It seems harsh. If that's the way you're thinking about it, then you are failing to understand 
failing to understand the holiness of our creator God. God is perfectly and infinitely good and just. Because God is good, God loves goodness more than any other being loves that which is good. And because, for the same reason, right, because God is good, he hates all sin. He hates all wickedness more than any other being hates wickedness. God, as creator, sets the standard of good and evil. Right, in a world that has no idea how to root those things, how do we know what's good and evil? There's one creator God, he's always existed. He's the judge. He determines those things. He's sovereign over all. He created the heavens and the earth. That is our standard. So God as creator sets the standard for good and evil, and then God as judge upholds those standards perfectly. He upholds those standards perfectly because he's good. Right? Every violation of God's holy law will, will therefore be perfectly punished. Because God is a good and a just judge. Just as you would not call it goodness, right? it's not, we'd not call it goodness if a convicted rapist went free. So God will not allow sin against him, which whether we like it or not, are far greater crimes right, than we could ever commit against another creature. A sin against our creator is far greater. And so he will not allow any of these sins to go unpunished. He's far too good to do so. Far too good to allow injustice in his judgments. And so if all have sinned, if all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, then we all deserve death. We all deserve death. We only, we not only deserve physical death, we deserve eternal death. We as created beings cannot pay for our sins against an eternal God in a moment. Sin against the eternal God, which we have all committed, requires eternal judgment. The only possible solution for us as sinners, then, is to have a substitute who is able and willing to stand in our place. Someone who would bear our cross as covenant breakers. And so we behold Christ doing just that on the cross as we come to verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus cries out in the first words, the first verse of Psalm 22, which we read through last week. We looked at a few of these verses last week, but the first half of this psalm is worth reading again so that we can clearly see the picture of what is taking place. So think of Christ on the cross as you hear these words from Psalm 22. It says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far off from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and, and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm. And no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing that he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. As an aside, bulls were offered up in sacrifice only by the priests or by the people of Israel as a whole. Just think about that in the context of those who are standing against Christ here. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Could the psalmist be any clearer? I may tell all my bones they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Be thou, but be thou not far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. 
Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. Again, this is the first half of Psalm 22. I leave off the second half because Psalm 22, uh, and we sing that second half, so you're familiar with it. But that second half is a glorious picture of the resurrection of Christ, which we'll be looking at towards the end of Mark 16. But this first half is clearly Jesus on the cross. They've pierced my hands and my feet. There are a few things we should note about Christ's use of this psalm while he was hanging on the cross. First, you may hear this prayer. You may think of this prayer as a cry of complete despair and hopelessness on the part of Christ. You may think of it that way when you hear, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But this was not the case. This was not the case. This was a cry of faith. Which is why Jesus still calls God his God. My God. My God. That's a relational, that's a relational phrase. This psalm is actually a prayer for deliverance even in the midst of being forsaken. It's a prayer for deliverance even in the midst of being forsaken. And so what we see here, what we must see here is the unshakable faith of Christ even in the moment of his greatest agony and suffering. And so for us, remember that times of great suffering are not grounds, never grounds, to forsake calling upon God. They are times to lean in all the more to trust God. Who do you think is bringing the trial? There are times to lean in all the more to trust God, knowing that he will be faithful, even when it seems from every outward appearance like hope is completely lost. Think about this in your own life. Allow Christ to serve as a model for you in your own prayers. God, why is my child sick again? My God, why has this enemy at work been such a plague to me? God, why has my marriage felt like a continual failure? God, why have I not received the gift of a spouse? Maybe the trials in your life have come to you to wake you up out of a spiritual stupor to show you the vanity of living for anything in your life if you're not living firstly for the glory of the only God. If these types of questions are in your heart, then do not come to God in prayer with a bland thanksgiving for the day. Bland and insincere prayers. Do not come to Him with pain in your heart or questions burning in your mind and refuse to pour them out before Him as if He does not care about your troubles. Or as if there's some better solution than crying out to God whether you're in frustration or confusion. Where else are you going to go? Who else has the words of life? Don't hide your fears and frustrations from God. Take them to him. Follow Christ as he pours out his anguish, but remembers, as he's pouring out this anguish, anguish remembers God's faithfulness and pleads for help and deliverance. You cannot do better than this. Sometimes that deliverance is not an outside enemy, by the way. Sometimes that deliverance is much closer. Sometimes it's your own hard heart. Pray to God for deliverance. Trust that he will do so. Christ cried out on the cross in the words of Psalm 22, and though they were in one sense certainly declared with an abiding trust in God, make no mistake, they were indeed a cry which came in the midst of a great judgment being poured out on Christ. We don't want to minimize that in the least. This, as we know from what Jesus has already said in Mark's gospel, was no surprise for Jesus. Jesus knew this event was coming, and he knew the horror of it. He wasn't surprised by the horror of it either. Jesus made this explicit when two of his disciples, remember James and John, asked to, have, uh, to get basically the promise from Jesus that they could have the seats of power in his kingdom at his right and his left hand. James and John brothers asked Jesus if they can sit at the right and left hand of Jesus when he comes in his kingdom. But recall Jesus' response to them on that occasion. So this is Mark 10, verses 38 and 39. So they've just asked this of Jesus. Jesus uh, but Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. There are two things I want to draw out from Christ's statement here to these two disciples. 
in regard to what he came to do in establishing his kingdom. The first is in regard to this cup that Jesus would drink, which we've already looked at in Mark's gospel, but we'll revisit shortly. And the second is in regard to the baptism with which Christ would be baptized. We've looked at that as well, obviously, when we were in Mark 10, but I think we're given new light on this in our text this morning. The two are related, but there's important pictures of both of these in our text. As we saw when we went through this text in Mark chapter 10, a few months ago, the cup Jesus would drink would be the cup of God's wrath. Again, we see this cup, just as we see the darkness as a picture of judgment, we see this cup in the Old Testament as a picture of judgment. You can listen to that sermon in Mark 10 to get more uh, cross-references there, but one example would be Psalm 75, verses 6 through 8. The psalmist says, For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. And the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same. On who? He says, but the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. Right, this cup is representative of God's judgment, which is poured out on the wicked, on those who do evil and stand opposed to the will of God. Jesus spoke of this cup being given to him by the Father, remember when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark 14. Right, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not my will but yours be done. He's speaking of this same cup, the cup of wrath, due for the people of God that Christ was going to drink in their place. Jesus, though he had enjoyed nothing but perfect fellowship with the Father for all eternity past, was forsaken by God on the cross because he was taking upon himself the wrath of God that was due for us, the death we deserve. Sin, again, must be Paid for, and so Christ came to pay that penalty, to drink that cup in his sufferings and death. Though Jesus was perfectly righteous, he came to drink the cup of wrath due for his chosen people. The baptism Christ came to be baptized with was to be plunged into the waters of God's judgment. Right, just like we see as a picture in the flood. Right, these waters which represent the judgment of God. Christ was plunged into them. But to understand the parallels Mark's drawing out here. With this picture of baptism, we must first understand or read through the remainder of our text this morning. So coming to verse 35, why do the Jews standing by think that Jesus is calling on Elijah? Well, it's most likely that they thought that that's what Jesus was saying when he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. He's crying out in great anguish. And so potentially, right, we're not given exactly why they're thinking this, but that's a, a reasonable potential as to what why, why this miscommunication would happen where they're thinking, oh, he must be calling on Elijah. The only real alternative uh, that you see commentators putting forward is the idea that Jesus is praying to Elijah and therefore calling Elijah his God. I think that's ridiculous. And so just throw that aside. Uh, so I think mishearing Jesus, right, LOI, LOI, they think he's calling on Elijah. Remember, right, we looked at this already in Mark's gospel, but remember that these Jews are expecting Elijah to return before the coming of the Messiah. Right? And they've missed the fact that Jesus made it very plain, hey, John the Baptist fulfilled this prophecy of Elijah coming. John the Baptist came to prepare, prepare the way of the Lord to make straight a path for the Messiah. That's already happened. That's already happened. I am the Messiah. They've missed that completely. So they're still awaiting a return of Elijah. And so that's a big deal in this situation. Right? That's, there's a lot of background to them saying, maybe Elijah's going to come here. Prepare the way of the Lord as the Lord hung on a cross before them to die for their sins. Right? See the blindness of Israel here. Everything's already happening. There's a few steps behind, to say the least, in what's taking place before them, right? in the history of redemption. So John the Baptist is the fulfillment of this prophecy regarding Elijah returning to prepare Israel for the coming of the Messiah. We see there's vinegar offered to Christ as he hung on the cross in verse 36. And then all stood by wanting to leave room, we read, for Elijah to intervene if we should so choose. Wait, 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 back up, back up. Let's see if Elijah's going to come and take him down from the cross. Save this man. And again, what blind onlookers they were. They did not see that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of Elijah. And they did not know that it was one far greater than Elijah that they mocked as he suffered and died with their approval. They are awaiting the one who would prepare the way of the Messiah as they crucified the Messiah. Again, Mark pointing out such irony for us. Christ cried out again in verse 37. And though Mark does not record Jesus' exact words in this last cry on the cross, we read from John chapter 19, verse 30, that Jesus declared here, it is finished. And he cried out triumphantly. And that's something to Mark. That's not normal as someone dies on a cross. Normally when someone dies on a cross, they 
die out in a whimper. It's a horrible way to die. You're literally just slowly getting weaker and weaker and weaker until you die. And yet Jesus cries out here. And we're going to see that that's, I think, one of the things, one of the many things affecting this Roman centurion who's looking on, this Roman soldier, in terms of his declaration that Jesus is the Son of God. After this cry, and after about three hours of hanging on the cross, Jesus died. At the moment of Jesus' death, in verse 38, Mark tells us that the veil of the temple, as I mentioned before, was ripped from the top to the bottom, ripped completely in half from the top to the bottom. This veil was specifically the veil which separated the holy place in the temple, that's where the priests would minister, from the holy of holies inside the temple. The holy of holies, this is the innermost part of the temple, which housed the Ark of the Covenant, over which sat the mercy seat in the two golden cherubim. This was the special place of God's presence within the temple, this holy of holies. And the Israelites were not allowed to enter this place. Not like it's frowned upon. No, like you're going to die if you go in there. The only exception to going into the holy of holies was one time a year and only by the high priest and only to make atonement for sin, to sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice and to back out right, with a rope tied around his heel. In case he died while he was in there. So they might pull him out without another person. If, if they just went in to get him, it'd just be death after death after death. That's the holiness of this place. That's what's symbolized for us in the Holy of Holies. The veil represented the separation which stood between the Holy God and sinners. It was not a safe place for sinners to go. Right? Do you think of God that way? Not a safe place. It is not safe to go into the presence of God as a sinner, not covered by a sufficient sacrifice. That's the picture given to us in the Holy of Holies. God is good. What does that mean to you? Because it's not safe to go before the good and holy God if it's just you. Not covered in the blood of a sufficient sacrifice. That is the furthest place from safety you could find. It's not a safe place. And yet at Christ's death, at Christ's death, this veil was ripped. This veil standing over 25 yards tall. It's like 75 feet ish tall being ripped from top to bottom what's the point there of understanding the size of that and understanding the fact that it was ripped from top to bottom well this was not a work of man it's not a man ripping this in half this is the work of god the rending of the temple veil was the work of god the word used here for rending right bringing this back to this idea of baptism the word used here for rending the temple veil is used only one other time in Mark's gospel account. Only one other time. And it was interestingly at Christ's baptism. All the way back in Mark chapter 1 when Christ was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, the heavens were, the same word used, rent open as the Spirit descended on Christ in the form of a dove and the Father declared His good pleasure over His Son. This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus received his baptism from John, we remember, to uh, fulfill all righteousness in our place, right? He received this baptism even in our place. And Jesus was doing the same thing in his baptism unto death. Jesus was plunged into the waters of God's great judgment on the cross, being forsaken on the cross by God so that we might never be separated from God's love. Jesus was forsaken on the cross that all who trust in him would never be separated from God's love. In Christ's first baptism, the Father declared his good pleasure over Jesus. In his baptism on the cross, the Father was pleased to crush him. Remember the words of Isaiah 53, verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. In Christ's first baptism, God identified Jesus as the Son of God. No one around is noticing this at that time, right? Only God is declaring it positively over his Son. This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. On the cross, a Roman soldier. How far could you get to the other end of the spectrum? A pagan soldier. Unable. Right? Why is he declaring that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, he's unable to deny that this is an innocent man. He knows the two men on his sides. He knows they're thieves. This is not his first time seeing a, a crucifixion. He's certainly overseen them before. But he sees that there's, there's a uniqueness and that this is an innocent man suffering. No legitimate charges against him. This Roman centurion is unable to ignore 
a very tangible fact of three hours of literal darkness that just surrounded them. And that as, it, as the man on the cross cries out, it is finished, again, not a cry, not a, a valiant cry, just in and of itself is a weird thing to happen at, on, at the end of a crucifixion. Right? Even Pilate's going to be surprised by it. We'll see in the next check of Mark 15 that Jesus is already dead. But at the, as he cries out, it is finished, the, the darkness goes away. So he's picking up on that. He's not an idiot. He sees that that just happened. Seems to be a pretty strong correlation happening between this man crying out that he's been forsaken by God, crying out, it is finished valiantly, and the darkness dissipating, going away. And so he declares that Jesus is truly the Son of God in verse 39. This man likely does not know the depth of his declaration, but by the providence of God, this declaration gives us the most fitting conclusion to Christ's sufferings and death on the cross. What was known again, what was known and declared only by the Father at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark so, is so plainly on display with what has taken place. The, the picture is, how can you not see it? How can you not see that truly this is the Son of God? It's so plain that the Roman centurion is the one calling it out. declared for us by a pagan Roman soldier, all the while a blind Jewish crowd looks on in an evil ignorance. The vow in Genesis 15 was that the breaker of the covenant would need to be slain. The breaker of the covenant would need to be slain. And so what's the difference that we see in the death of Christ? What's the difference that we see? Christ indeed died in the place of us covenant breakers. All who put their faith in Jesus, all who repent of their sins and put faith in Jesus will be saved. They will have their covenant Uh, Their broken covenant sins, their sins that broke covenant with God paid for in the cross of Christ if they're trusting in him. And so what's the difference as Christ indeed died in the place of his covenant breakers, was indeed forsaken by God? Well, instead of Christ being ripped in two on the cross, what was ripped in two? The veil of the temple. The veil of the temple was ripped in two. In the book of Hebrews, Paul makes plain for us the implications of this temple veil being rent as it was. It's worth reading at length. Hebrews chapter 10, I'll read verses 1 through 20. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So when you think about, right, the Jews have been making sacrifices in the temple for a long time. And for them, that's what atonement means, right? They didn't see it as permanent. They saw it as temporary, but they would go to the the, the temple to offer sacrifices, and that was how they made atonement for sin. And so what's Paul pointing out here in Hebrews? Well, he's saying that's having to be done year by year. It's never going to make anyone perfect. He says, for then they they would have ceased to be offered. But, uh, but because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins, right? If that was sufficient, you could have just offered it once and been done with it. He says, but in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance again of sins every year. These sacrifices aren't sufficient. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Those are not image bearers of God. We as image bearers of God have sinned against them. We need a sufficient sacrifice in our place. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, talking about Christ here, he saith, Sacrifices and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast, hast thou prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law, then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away, what's Christ doing in this? When he's saying it's not just, it's not going to be continual sacrifices forever. These are going to cease. So he taketh away the first that he may establish the second, a new way, a better way. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How many times? Once for all. Once for all. And every priest, every priest standing daily ministereth, I'm sorry, standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. By this man, by Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God henceforth, from henceforth expecting, till his enemies shall be be made his footstool. For by one offering, that's the third time he said it, one offering, 
Thousands upon thousands of bulls and goats offered in that temple. Year after year, day after day. From henceforth expecting till his enemies should be made his foot soul. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost is also a witness for us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. The covenant God will make with his people after those days. Saith the Lord, I will put my law into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and their iniquities I will, will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. That's into the holy of holies. That place where it's not safe. Not safe for a sinner to enter on his own. It says, brethren, we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Fellowship with God. Not some remote, temporary atonement for sin. Direct fellowship with God. Entrance into the Holy of Holies. Unthinkable to the Jews. By a new and living way. What is the way? Which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. The veil of the temple was ripped in half from the top to the bottom because Jesus is the perfect mediator between God and man. His life and death in our place was sufficient to give us safe entry into the presence of God to restore fellowship between the holy God and sinful men. This is not a picture of God deciding to be lax on sin. No, this is a picture of sinners being perfectly clothed in the righteousness of the God-man Jesus Christ. Therefore, able, you in Christ are able to stand before God with sins forgiven because they've been sprinkled with the blood of Christ the perfect sacrifice of Christ. The Jews mocked Christ for saying he would destroy the temple. But in his death, we see the veil of the temple torn asunder, a declaration that this temple would soon be no more. The Old Testament system was being thrown down and a new and living way to the throne of God was being made available for us through the veil of Christ's flesh. Christ received this baptism unto death, but he would emerge out of the waters of this baptism of judgment unto everlasting and glorious resurrection life. Jesus died so that the cup of wrath that was due for your lips could be emptied. Jesus died so that he could take that cup for you and then offer you a cup of blessing. A cup of blessing. He was baptized in the judgment of God so that we can be brought safely through the waters of judgment in Him and share with Him in His everlasting life. The following two verses in Hebrews 10, verses 21 and 22, tell us what we ought to do in light of this glorious truth. And having an high priest over the house of God, that's who Jesus is for us, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Salvation can be yours because Jesus died. Right? His death was a sufficient payment for your sins if you're trusting in him. The, the threads of the veil of the temple could not hold together. The threads of that temple veil could not hold together as Christ offered himself before the Father in your place. That veil no longer made a valid declaration about our relationship with God as sinners. It's no longer true. If you're trusting in God, what's your relationship with him in Christ? Christ gave us entrance into the throne room of God. Your assurance, your assurance is not in the soundness of your doctrine. It's not in the sacrifices that you've made for your family, whatever you define as a good person. You haven't even lived up to that standard, but we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Your good works, the sacrifices you've made, will not stand on the day of judgment. Your assurance of salvation is not in your perception of the genuineness of your repentance or in how confident you are in the quality of your faith. Remember, right back to our introduction, our faith is not an ethereal one. It's not an ethereal faith. This is essential. Jesus truly died. The veil of the temple was literally ripped in half from top to bottom. And this is where we root our assurance of faith. Your assurance is based on what God has objectively done for you in Jesus Christ. The declaration made of the death of Christ was that this work was sufficient. Your work will never be sufficient. His work was sufficient. To draw near to God on your own will always result in death. 
But in Christ, our hearts are made clean from all unrighteousness, our bodies washed of all sin, and we can come to God with confidence through him. Jesus in his death was indeed vindicated as the Son of God, as the Messiah of Israel. Plain as day for those who have eyes to see. And so no matter your current trial, no matter the list of your past failures, no matter the doubts with which you are currently struggling, you have a high priest now seated at the Father's right hand, making his enemies his footstool, calling his people to draw near. And so, draw near, knowing that there's life to be found nowhere else. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us to believe that truth, that there is uh, no life to be found outside of you, nowhere to turn but to your Son uh, for words of life. And so we pray that you'd help us to be a people um, who by your Spirit uh, see and glory in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Help us to cling to nothing else for our salvation. Uh, Equip us uh, to articulate these truths well as we go forth to so many in our community believing vain philosophies. Help us to teach them of the glorious truth uh, which you present to us in your word uh, of God in the flesh living for us, dying for us, um, declaring that um, the work of salvation has been finished in his cross, um, glorying in the fact that he has risen from the dead and has ascended to your right hand, ruling and reigning now. Pray that you would uh, help us to go forth this week as your people, uh, living lives of righteousness to the end that the kingdoms of this earth might become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.